Therefore, it's now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Deputy Premier. For over a year, a dark cloud of disgrace has hovered above the Premier's office as she staunchly defended Pat Sabera during the Sudbury by-election bribery scandal. It got worse when the Premier defended the Minister of Energy when he was named in the charges laid by the OPP. And then, shockingly, yesterday in a Sudbury courthouse, a federal Crown prosecutor alleged the Minister of Energy sought certain benefits, offers jobs or employment as part of his condition to run as an MPP. The prosecutor stated that Thibault was not charged because it is only illegal to offer a bribe, not seek or accept one. Mr. Speaker, this is startling news, and it raises serious ethical questions, and the public rightfully question. is questioning whether they can trust the minister. Mr. Speaker, my question is, there is no doubt that the public is concerned about the Minister of Energy. Will the Premier, will the government do the right thing and force him to resign? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Well, thank you, Speaker. And uh, I'll just remind the Leader of the Opposition once again that we have been very open with uh, the public, with this Legislature, about the uh, allegations related to the Sudbury by election. Now that charges have been laid, Speaker, we believe, they should believe, that the right place to deal with these charges is in the court. And that's where we will leave it, Speaker. The legislature is no place to deal with this issue. Can supplementary. Mr. Speaker, it's almost laughable when the deputy premier says open. We only hear about stuff when the government members get charged. We only hear about it when we're hearing about ethical examples of breaches of crossing the line. So, Mr. Speaker, my question, my question is. Stop the clock. <laughs> Not a good start. I'll put it on the record that we'll move to warnings if I have to, and I'll do so quickly if needed. Please finish your question. Mr. Speaker, I, I'm going to read a quote from the Premier's speech of the Liberal AGM. She said, people look at me and many of them think she's not who we thought she was. She's become a typical politician. She'll do anything to win. And the Premier added, Frankly, I think sometimes we have given them reason to think that. This is one of those examples when you've given people reason to doubt that this is simply, simply the bad side of politics. So my question is, if you want to be different, if this government isn't simply another politician, another bad example that causes the public question. to lose their confidence, why won't they do the right thing and ask the Minister of Energy to resign? There's this ethical cloud that Thank everyone you. in the province can see except this Liberal government. Thank you. Please. 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 Thank you. Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, if, if we want to talk about ethical clouds, maybe you could respond to this ethical cloud, Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition's Chief of Staff was re recently caught holding secret negotiations with Farber, former Scarborough Rouge River candidate Queenie Yu. The PC's top aide sent an email to Queenie Yu flip-flopping again on the sex ed curriculum the very same day as the deadline for withdrawing a candidate from the race. Speaker, there are many questions, many ethical questions surrounding that. Stop. While while I would like the uh, opposition to come to order, it's not helpful that the government side of the benches are making as much noise. As it continues while I'm speaking, Finish your answer, please. So, Speaker, when asked if the party was trying to convince you to withdraw from the race, the PC leader declined answer. to comment. Now, I think it's time he comments, Speaker. Final supplement. That's all you have left. Mr. Speaker, once again, we have a serious question for the Deputy Premier, and all we get is grasping at straws and diversion techniques. 
We have a serious case right here. The OPP have laid charges. I don't want political gains. I don't want diversions. I want this government to actually sure. answer a question for once in their lives. So I'm going to go back. The Minister of the Crown is alleged to have sought a bribe from the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff. Though the matter of Mr. Sabera is, Ms. Severa is before the court, the matter is of public confidence and is rightfully debated in the legislature. The minister has been named in the charges laid by the OPP. He has tarnished his office and shaken the public's confidence in his ability. Mr. Speaker, stepping down is not an admission of guilt by the Minister of Energy. It is simply the honourable thing to do. So, Mr. Speaker, my question once again to the Deputy Premier, and please answer the question. Will you ask the Minister of Energy to resign? And if not, are you saying that nothing wrong was done by Pat Sabera or Glenn Tebow? Yes or no? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Uh, well, well, Speaker, I, I have another, another question, and I know it's supposed to be a question put to me, but I do want to say, Speaker. A few of you are pushing me to warnings. Finish, please. As a speaker, a remarkable coincidence happened on one day in 2000. A member from Dufferin Caledon, come to order. If it happens again, we'll go to warnings. Carry on. Uh, uh, um, speaker, on that day, the, the PC member for Halliburton Kawartha Lakes Brock resigned her seat and the very same day accepted a paid position in 2009. The member from Sonia Lampton will come to order. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke come to order. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke second time. The member the Minister of Municipal Affairs come to order. We've now chosen to go to warnings. I will issue warnings. Finish, please. Uh, the Sudbury Star said Scott trades jobs or seat for head office job. Start the clock. Finish, please. Peterborough Examiner said, in exchange for giving up her seat, Scott is taking on the endowment. The member from Oxford is warned. The member from Simcoe Gray is warned. And we'll continue. Finish, please. In exchange for giving up her seat, Scott is taking on the enormous responsibility. We're, we're going to get this. The member from uh, Prince Edward Hastings is warned. Carry on. And the Toronto Star said Progressive Conservative Laurie Scott will resign from the central Ontario seat and take on the job of getting the opposition ready for the next election. Thank Tory you. said in Lindsay. Right. New question. The member from Leeds General. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. The member from Leeds Granville. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. I know I can't ask my question to the Minister of Energy, so I'm going to ask uh, to, to the Attorney General. But I include, uh, encourage the Attorney General and Government House Leader to use Standing Order 37E. It allows him to refer the question to another minister, and I encourage him to pass it to the Minister of Energy. A federal Crown Prosecutor has accused the Minister of Energy of seeking an alleged bribe. Guilty or innocent, charged or not charged, an accusation of this magnitude shatters any moral or ethical authority this minister has to govern. And it also calls into question whether the public can trust this minister. He cannot and he must not remain as a minister until the case concludes. So, Speaker, again, I'm going to ask the Attorney General, I, I implore him to use uh, 37E and refer it to the Minister of Energy. Since the Crown Federal Prosecutor has accused the Minister of Energy Question. for seeking an alleged bribe, will the Minister of Energy resign until the case against Patricia Sorbera has been concluded? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Speaker. And I remind the member opposite again, and I think he, he knows this very well, that uh, that this matter is before the courts, and it's it's not appropriate for this matter to be to be discussed here in in the legislature. Uh, Speaker, I want to be very clear, and, and contrary to what the leader of the opposition uh, said, no member of this house has been charged in this matter. Let's be absolutely clear, uh, uh, Speaker, on, on this. Uh, the Minister of Energy uh, uh, continues to do his job honorably as the Minister of Energy. He continues to serve the people of Sudbury honorably, uh, uh, Speaker. Uh, there are no charges against him, nor are there any charges against any member of, of this House. There are two charges laid against individuals who do not serve Answer. in this House, Speaker. That matter is before the courts, and it's only appropriate that it be dealt with um, in the court. Thank, Thank you. you. Supplementary. Again, back to the Attorney General. For once, I actually agree with this government. I do believe that guilt or innocence is a matter for the courts. And the opposition would not ask that this case be tried here in the Legislative Assembly. But this isn't about the outcome of the bribery charges. These questions aren't about the matter before the courts. They are about the trust in this minister of the Crown. This is about the moral and ethical implications of a minister that's being named in a bribery charge by the Ontario Provincial Police. Mr. Speaker, how can the public trust this Minister of Energy to do his job when his ethics have been questioned by a federal prosecutor? How can he do that? Why doesn't he do the honourable thing and resign? He should resign. Thank you. Attorney General. The Deputy Premier, Speaker. Deputy Premier. Thank you, Speaker. And, uh, you know, as we look in history, we're seeing some more examples, I think, where uh, uh, the leader of the opposition maybe wishes he could revisit some decisions. I'm looking to July 22, 2015, when Brown, uh, the leader of the opposition, thanks Garfield Dunlop for 35 years of public service at the municipal and provincial level and said the former PC education critic would now be the chief education advisor to the party speaker. So I just wonder whether, whether Mr. Dunlop could actually provide some education to the leader of the opposition on, on throwing stones in glass houses, speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. I'm going to again try to go back to the uh, Attorney General. There are numerous ministers who have stepped down when they've been named in an investigation. My predecessor, Senator Runciman, the member for Simcoe Gray, yep. uh, the li former Liberal uh, Finance Minister, Greg Sorbera. They all left office until the ethical questions that surrounded them had been cleared. I just can't, Speaker, I can't for the life of me understand why this Minister of Energy has not already tendered his resignation. Yep. I, I can't understand it. No. It's beyond me. You know, again, Speaker, we're talking about doing the honourable thing. No, we, no we're asking there. what Ontarians expect that he would have already <clears throat> done. The people who had elected him in that by-election in Sudbury, they all think the same way. They can't understand why you haven't already tendered your resignation and stepped aside. So, Question. Speaker, I'm going to give him another chance. 
uh, Attorney General, refer the matter under 37E to the Minister of Energy. Will the Minister of Energy do the right thing? Thank Will you. he resign? Well, Speaker, you know, I, I think what, what we're hearing is some, uh, some attack on this on that side to this way but they are very uncomfortable with hearing allegations that maybe they behaved in a questionable way so whether it's queenie you whether it's garfield dunlop whether it's the member from victoria lakes uh, kawartha Hall halliburton kawartha lakes brock whether it's the leader of the opposition himself speaker we have clearly documented examples where i suggest the member from Leeds Grenville is warned. Finish, please. Speaker, it, would, it is beyond me to understand how they can be calling on us to do what they call the honourable thing when it is very, Sir? very clear that the transgressions on that party are far more serious. Speaker. Thank you. A new question, the member from Burnley-Gillamalton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the deputy speaker or to the deputy leader. The Criminal Code of Canada states very clearly that it, it is an offence if, quote, a member of parliament or of the legislature of a province directly or indirectly corruptly accepts, obtains, agrees to accept, or attempts to obtain for themselves or another person any money valuable consideration, office, place, or employment in respect of anything done or admitted to be done or admitted by them in their official capacity, end quote. After standing before an Ontario judge, a federal prosecutor said, quote, Mr. Thibault sought certain benefits, offer, or job, or employment as a part of his conditions to run as an MPP. Now, without getting into end quote, to get it, without getting into any details of this allegation, without into getting into Question. any details, does this raise any concerns for the government? Well, Speaker, as has been said many, many times, that is an issue that is before the court, and that is where it belongs. But I do think you will recall in 2013, the NDP party decided to install Adam Giambroni as their candidate in Scarborough Guildwood, Speaker. Now, Giambroni, who was parachuted into the riding and the party hierarchy, allegedly, allegedly stacked the nomination meeting, according to the Toronto Star. Uh, with the apparent backing of NDP leader Andrea Horvath and the party brass, Giambroni decided that he would like the nomination, even though riding association insiders confessed he was not known to them. The president of the NDP Scarborough Guildwood Riding Association said Thursday he is determined to get answers for why the party appears to have orchestrated Answer. Adam Giambroni's nomination. And a 92-year-old volunteer, Joy Taylor, Thank said you. That she would quit. The party. Thank you. Supplementary. The current member for Sudbury was a federal MP until he was given the provincial Liberal nomination. Now, federal prosecutor says very clearly that, quote, Mr. Tebow sought certain benefits, offers, or job or employment as a part of his conditions to run as an MPP, end quote. Now, my question is, what benefits, if any, was Mr. the Minister of Energy offered? Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, I guess uh, the, uh, I think we'd all be interested in knowing, Speaker, what uh, uh, when, the, when the member from Bramley Gore Malton was considering a run at the federal NDP leadership, Speaker, that was widely known, widely reported, he ended up on the front bench, Speaker. He ended up as deputy leader. I'm just curious, Speaker, whether that was just a coincidence or was there some reason that he ended up on the front bench as deputy leader, Speaker, and has so far at least not appeared to be running for the federal leadership. Thank you. Final supplementary. The government denies that the Minister of Energy has anything to do or is in any way connected to the bribery scandal. But the OPP believe that the campaign director for the Liberal Party offered a bribe to the Minister of Energy. And now the federal prosecutor says that the minister sought, quote, certain benefits, offers, or jobs or employment as a condition of running. My question is simple. When did the government learn that the 
current member for Sudbury had asked for any benefits. Well, thank you, Speaker. And you know, there is a matter before the courts, that's where it belongs, but I can tell you that the Minister of Energy is a fabulous member of this legislature. That he is doing extremely hard work on a very challenging file, and he is indeed bringing down the cost of energy for people across this province by 8% come January 1st, and the most rural customers, Speaker, will see a 20% decline. This is a member who exemplifies public service. We are delighted that he is serving the people of Ontario, and that is, uh, we're very proud of that. We think he's a terrific person, and we need to let what happened in the court happen in the court, Speaker. Thank you. You see it, please. Be seated, please. I'm, uh, I'm asking when you be seated to be seated when I asked you the first time. New question, the member from Bramley Gormont. So my question again is to the Deputy Premier. The government insists that nothing illegal happened, that the Minister of Energy is not charged, that there is no Elections Act offence yet charged, laid. But the people of Ontario deserve better. They deserve a higher bar than that. Politicians should meet a higher bar than not doing something illegal. Does the Acting Premier believe that it's appropriate for the Minister of Energy to continue to sit in Cabinet when a federal prosecutor believes that he was offered a benefit as a condition for him to run and to win in that seat? Well, of course we believe he should be here, and he's doing a terrific job. But I do want to go back to 2013 scarborough Guildwood by-election, by Speaker. The nomination was such a schmozzle, the NDP nomination, that 92-year-old volunteer Joy Taylor said she's not only quit the Ryan executive, but she quit the party she was so disgusted, Speaker. She went on to say they know they were deceitful, but they're doing everything in their power to deny it. Speaker, well, I think that, uh, uh, that that's just not acceptable in any party, Speaker, and I think the holier-than-thou approach that the NDP is taking, Speaker, they need, they need to explain what happened in Scarborough Guildwood, what happened when the member from Bramley Gore Malton decided to, uh, to give up his federal ambitions for the deputy leadership of the Ontario NDP? Thank you. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. When Greg Sabera, the, the former finance minister's name, simply appeared in RCMP warrant, simply a name and a warrant, he decided to do the honourable thing and step aside until his name was cleared, until that was dealt with. The Minister of Energy is at the centre of the scandal. He's at the centre. He's the subject matter of an alleged bribe. It's absolutely appropriate for him to do the honourable thing. And in fact, we have a federal prosecutor that states that he accepted or potentially accepted a benefit for him to run. Now, will the government do the right thing in this circumstance? Take a page from their own former member, from Mr. Sobera, and actually do the honourable thing and resign until this matter is dealt with. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Speaker, the, uh, the, the Minister of Energy, as I said earlier, is doing an outstanding job. He's doing an outstanding job as Minister. He's doing an outstanding job as a member for Sudbury, Speaker. He is a very strong representative of that area. We are proud to call him a Liberal. We are proud to have him in our caucus, Speaker. He's doing important work on the energy file, a very, very complex file. He has mastered the file, and he is moving forward to reduce the cost to Ontarians, Speaker. We have done an important job cleaning up this, uh, the mess that we inherited in the electricity system, and we're now turning our attention to make sure that electricity Answer. is affordable. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the Premier was elected on a promise of a fresh start. After the bad ethics of the Dalton McGuinty years, the Premier promised that things would be different, that Ontarians could expect to find a government that was open, transparent, with integrity and ethics. Instead, the people see a government that is only interested in its own self-interest, protecting its own cabinet ministers and its own insiders. Over the weekend, the Premier made it clear the reason that she was so unpopular was that she wasn't who the people thought they voted for, and that's true. 
But here's an opportunity to do the right thing. Here's an opportunity, Mr. Speaker, for the government to restore a little bit of faith, to take a step towards restoring faith and doing the right thing and show some leadership. In this circumstance, the right thing is for the Minister of Energy to resign from his cabinet position until the Question. allegations are dealt with. Will this government show some leadership, restore faith in government, and do the right thing? Thank you. Thank you. Well, speak, uh, speak. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister. Uh, speaker, I think that the member for Bramley Gore Malton should actually show some leadership himself and tell us what happened. How is it that he put his federal leadership aspirations on hold, and how is it that he became deputy leader of the NDP? Speaker, I think if he's calling for transparency, he should look in the mirror and actually share with us the story of how that happened. Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my question is for the Deputy Premier. I've spoken in the House before about a Simcoe County firefighter, Bill Wilkins. He served the province and the city of Barrie. Bill tragically lo lost his life responding to a call. I vividly remember attending the funeral of Bill Wilkins in 2002 and how it shook our community and, frankly, left his family without help. Mr. Speaker, on my first day in the House as an MPP, I asked this question about the need to have a Heroes Fund. I believe we as a province can do more. I believe we can help those families like the Wilkins family. Mr. Speaker, will the Liberal government support a Heroes Fund to provide survivors' benefits for families of first responders who have fallen in the service of our province? When I asked this a year ago, the government said they would consider it. It would be looked at in the option of things we can do to support our first responders. A year, year and a half later, I'm asking again, Question. will they support this? It's the right thing to do for our first responders. The Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Community safety and correctional thank service. you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I want to thank the uh, leader of the opposition for the question. I want to recognize, obviously, the uh, hard work of our first responders and our firefighters who are here at Queens Park today for all of the uh, service that they provide for Ontarians. They are certainly true heroes in our communities. This uh, issue is obviously very important to us, and we do provide some resources. Uh, in this regard to support individuals and to recognize the work that they that they do uh, this week in fact here at Queen's Park on Thursday we'll have the uh, bravery awards recognizing uh, those first responders for the uh, outstanding outstanding service uh, you know speaker this is an important issue and I recognize the uh, leader of the opposition has requested uh, that we move in this direction it's something that we're considering. I think it's an important initiative, and I think we can continue to do more uh, to recognize those brave men and women who uh, defend and uh, support our communities each and every day. And so Thank I look you. forward to working with the member opposite to help uh, move this Thank type you. of initiative forward. Supplementary, the member from Perth Wellington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again to the Deputy Premier. On March 17, 2010, my community was devastated by the loss of two firefighters in a tragic building collapse. Firefighters Ken Ray and Ray Walder lost their lives and made the ultimate sacrifice when a building they ran into collapsed on them. Mr. Speaker, the least Ontario can do is support the families of men and women who lose their lives while saving others. Speaker, when will this government commit to a Heroes Fund expanding survivor benefits for the families of fallen first responders? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, uh, and again to the uh, to the member opposite. You know this is uh, this is an important issue. We recognize the uh, very very vital work of our uh, of our first responders. Uh, I know that um, we've increased uh, funding uh, for a, a wellness unit through, for example, the OPP. Uh, there's about 4.4 million dollars uh, in that particular program. We also offer programs such as the uh, Constable Joe McDonald Public Safety Officers Survivor Scholarship Fund, which provides scholarships for spouses and children of public safety officers killed in the line of duty. And Ontario is a leader in this country in providing supports and services for our police, firefighters, and other uh, first responders. So I'm committed uh, to working with the uh, with the individual opposite to uh, develop and enhance and continue to build on the programs that we offer to support our first responders and their and family, sir. Speaker. Thank you very much, my speakers, to the acting premier. 
uh, my question. The, the, this morning, the Premier's privatization expert recommended that the government find, quote, alternative financing structures to fund our digital health system. And the health minister keeps saying that his priority is to leverage health assets and maximize their value. But we've heard all this before, Mr. Speaker. The Premier promised not to sell Hydro One, and she did. She turned around and started selling off our public hydro to private investors. It's no wonder Ontarians cannot trust this government. Will the Acting Premier tell Ontarians what alternative financing structures the government has in mind for our private health records, and will she do it before the Premier makes another huge mistake that once again hurts the people of this province? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I was pleased uh, to join uh, Mr. Clark uh, for his uh, a press conference to deliver recommendations based on the work that I asked him to do, based on terms of reference that made it explicit that there would be no sale of e-health or digital health assets in this province, that there would be no sale of uh, individuals' personal health information. That was his terms of reference. He's reiterated that in his report as well. He makes no recommendation uh, pointing towards privatization or sale or of, of any elements of e-health, and that was the statement that I made at the press conference as well. So if the NDP insist on creating this mythological approach uh, of theirs, uh, that's their business to do. I've made it categorically Answer. clear uh, here in the Legislature, as the Premier has countless times and probably up to 20 times, where I've insisted that that's not on the table. Thank Mr. you. Speaker. Supplementary, the member from Nickelville. Again, to the Acting Premier, the people of Ontario are clear, Speaker. Care should drive health care decision, not profit. People, not private profits, should always come first in our health care system, but this government is putting private, first, private profit first. A year ago, the Premier Privatization Star said Ontario hospitals should be linked more closely to the private sector, and now the same advisor is calling for alternative financing structure to fund digital health care. Don't get me wrong, Speaker. We all know that digital health care will bring us benefit. Ontario owns the health info way right now, but it looks like the private sector will own the ramp to those info ways. People don't want the privatizations of Hydro One to be repeated in our health care system. People want to keep the digital health assets in public hands where our health care system Question. belongs. When will this government stand up for patients and reject any attempt to increase profit in our health care system? Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I couldn't have been clearer or more categorical in this morning's press conference when I indicated that there would be no sale of digital health assets, there would be no sale of private health information, Mr. Speaker. But maybe the third party has got caught up with what's been happening south of the border with the Trump uh, election, Mr. Speaker. They've created their own post-truth approach here uh, in Ontario, where they're making it up as they go along. There is no intention. They can continue continue to promulgate this myth, but the reality is, and I've stated it so many times, and this is consistent with the recommendation and the assertion of Mr. Clark this morning and in his report, there will be no sale. Thank you. No question. The member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Ensuring students receive the best possible education across Ontario is incredibly important. Ensuring that the dollars that we invest in our education system help support students in the best possible way is a fundamental principle driving everything that we do in this government. Minister, we all know how committed our government is to helping our children become lifelong learners. Ontario has a lot to be proud of in terms of student achievement, thanks in large part to our great educators and staff. Everyone knows that the party opposite ran on a plan to make cuts in education to fire teachers and education workers. This would have had a devastating impact on our world-recognized education system. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you tell us more about Question. the benefits of our government increasing investments in education all throughout Ontario? Thank you, Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to uh, thank the member from Kingston and the Islands for that question. I know what a strong advocate she is for her community and for young people in her community. Each year, Ontario welcomes about a 
about 100 delegations from the world's leading jurisdictions who are visiting to study Ontario as a model for delivering the better outcomes for our children and students. They look at our places of learning as well as what we do for our youngest learners in childcare all the way up. We help adults gain their formal education as well. Our educators, our teachers, students and their parents deserve credit. Through their hard work, Ontario's high school graduation rate increased to 85.5 per cent, the highest level in our province's history. So when the world notices yes, what sir. our children in our schools already know, that Ontario schools are the best places to learn. If we listened to the Thank PC you. plan for education, we wouldn't have Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. I know that Ontario's high school graduation rate has increased to the highest level in the province's history, with more students than ever graduating with the skills and knowledge that they need to reach their very full potential. We are extremely proud to see the results and influence of the investments of this government in our education system. It is important that we continue to support school boards in supporting the success of every single student in Ontario. Today, more students get more funding, and that's why we're seeing great returns on our investment in our children's achievement rate. The PC Party has questionable track record when it comes to education. When they were in government, they closed schools, increased class sizes, and in the last election, they ran on firing 100,000 workers, including educators. Given the history, the member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. The member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound is warned. I check my record. The member from Prince Edward Hastings has already been warned. He is therefore named. Anyone else? And that wasn't appropriate either, and if I knew who it was, they'd be warned. Finish, please. Given this history, can the minister please inform the House about our government's long track record of increasing investments in rural— The member from Stormont, Dundas, South Plangary is warned, and the member from Lanark, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington is warned. Carry on. Minister. Speaker. Speaker, education is a right, and a high-quality, well-rounded education is the right, rightful experience of Ontario's children that they benefit from every single day. And that's why we've worked so hard to make Ontario's education system one of the best in the world. But, Speaker, the member's question was specifically about rural school boards, so let's look at Prince Edward Hastings. Funding for Prince Edward Hastings School Board was increased by approximately $310 million, an increase of 84 per cent since 2003. Per-pupil funding has increased by $5,100 since 2003, an increase of $6,100. We've also built three new schools in this riding of Prince Edward Hastings. Harmony Public School, Sterling Public School, Tweed Public School. Even though the member from that area ran on firing teachers Answer. in his own community. On this side of the House, Speaker, we will continue to build Ontario's education system up, Thank especially you. in rural Ontario. Any question the member from Renfrew? You say it, please. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Speaker, I have a question for the Attorney General. Stop the clock, please. Yes, I'm looking into that now. Attorney General. Sweet.
Thank you. Member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Speaker, to the Attorney General. Yesterday, Crown Prosecutor Vern Brewer stated, and I quote, Our allegation is that Mr. Tebow sought certain benefits, offers, jobs, or employment as part of his condition to run as an MPP. Close quote. The prosecutor then stated that the reason that the Minister of Energy wasn't charged was because the section makes it an offence to offer an alleged bribe, not necessarily to receive one. <laughs> Speaker, my question to the Attorney General is simple. Are we really at a point where not appearing before a judge to face charges by a minister themselves is the bare standard that the, Crown, the minister must meet in order to remain in this question. Liberal Cabinet? Attorney General. Deputy Premier, Speaker. Deputy Premier. Thank you, Speaker. And um, this matter is before the courts, has been said many, many times. But I do think it might be interesting to review uh, some uh, some cases that have come here. And I think I think we do need some answers, Spear, uh, Spe Speaker. And, I want, to, I want to talk about kind of this mysterious and secret negotiations held between the leader of the opposition's chief of staff and candidate Queenie Liu in the recent uh, Scarborough Rouge River by-election. Speaker, you see, what happened was was uh, Queenie Liu had uh, questions. Queenie Yu, sorry, had questions around the leader's position on the sex ed curriculum, and I understand why she had questions because I think we all have questions because Answer. you had so many positions on it. But there was a to uh, PC's top aide sent an email the very same day that was the deadline to withdraw Thank from you. the race speaker. Supplementary. Back to the AG. AG. It used to be they punted questions to the AG. Now they're punting them away from them. <laughs> if the Premier was going to kill ministerial accountability, perhaps she could have at least shown up here for the funeral. Under this Liberal government, you can be investigated by the OPP and remain in the Premier's office. You can be investigated by the OPP and still remain in Cabinet. You can have a Crown prosecutor say that the only reason the Minister of Energy wasn't charged is because requesting an alleged bribe isn't an offence, only offering one is. Speaker, is there no ethical barrier this Liberal government won't cross, or is this just what it looks like when you care more about the fortunes of the Liberal Party and staying in power than you care about the people and the interests of the people of Ontario? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Deputy Premier. The speaker, I think um, the member from Halliburton Kawartha Lakes Brock is someone who is uh, respected by every person in this legislature. She's somebody that uh, we can work with. She has our respect, Speaker. But something very, very interesting happened back in 2009 when the new leader needed a riding to run in, Speaker. And the member, after some period of time, as I recall, the member from Halliburton. Halliburton Kawartha Lakes Brock resigned her seat so the new leader could run and accepted a paid position with the party the very same day, Speaker. Stop the clock. I, am, uh, I have been listening very carefully. The questions put are within the scope of the expectation that I have for Section 23H. You're getting close. Be very careful. Carry on. So, Speaker, I just have questions about this remarkable coincidence. Wow. And if the leader of the opposition is claiming that uh, that was just a coincidence, Answer. Speaker, uh, then uh, I guess I have to accept him at his face value. But it is passing strange. The very same Thank day you. the seat was resigned, the job. Yeah. New question, the member from Bramley, Gore, Malton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Before I begin the question, I also want to welcome members of QP Local 4914 who are here today. My colleague from Hamilton Mountain raised this issue yesterday and a number of times. The workers at the Peel Regional Children Aid Society, members of QP Local 4914, have been on the picket line now for three months. And Mr. Speaker, it's not about wages. They are striking because uh, for issues of safety, fairness, and above all, quality of care. 
These workers do what they do because they care deeply about the children and families they work for. That's why the workers are asking for a hard cap on the total number of active cases that they work at on one time. That's why they, well, that's what they feel is adequate or necessary to adequately protect children at risk. Workload caps exist in other jurisdictions and other children aid societies, but they don't exist in this particular one. Doesn't the minister think workers and children in Peel deserve the same quality of care as other jurisdictions? Thank you. Uh, you know, Speaker, as, um, as a former uh, Minister of Children and Youth Services, I got to know uh, kids in care of the CAS, and I uh, learned through that experience that of all the people in the responsibility, no greater responsibility is to the kids who have been uh, taken under the care of the province speaker uh, for whatever reason uh, they could not be, be uh, cared for by their own parents. Our responsibility to those kids trumps everything else we do. Having said that, Speaker, labour negotiations are a matter between the employer and the union. It is inappropriate for me to comment on that negotiation, Speaker. We are hopeful that the employer and the union will do all they can to achieve a successful resolution to this problem. But as I said, Speaker, these kids are our kids. We are responsible for kids in care of the CAS. We have to do everything we can to make sure they get the Answer. care they need. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Kids and families in Peel want to see this strike end as soon as possible. They want to see this resolved. And I understand there's only four outstanding issues that can be sent to binding arbitration. Negotiations have stalled, and currently the Peel CES management won't agree to go to arbitration. The children and families in Peel who rely on the CES can't wait for another month for this matter to be resolved. <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the government. Will the government intervene and get the parties to arbitration? Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for this very, very important question. Speaker, this, what we're seeing in the PLCAS is completely out of character for the usual experience of labour relations in the province of Ontario. Between 98 and 99 per cent of agreements are reached at without a resort to a lockout or a strike. That obviously isn't happening at the PLCAS. Speaker, what we do at the Ministry of Labour is we try to bring the parties back to the table. Speaker, in Ontario, we have some of the best mediators, some of the best arbitrators, in the country, Speaker. We've brought them to bear in this regard. What we're trying to do, Speaker, is with this highly skilled mediation team is working with QP, working with the employer. Speaker, there's nothing this government wants more, there's nothing the Ministry of Labour wants more than to see an agreement reached at the table, Speaker. I will tell you on a daily basis, yes, I keep track of this, and Speaker, it's something we take very, very seriously. Thank you. New question, the member from Barrie. Mr. Speaker, to the Minister of Education, parents from across Ontario came to Queen's Park yesterday to highlight the importance of rural schools in our province. I was impressed by the passion that they had for their children's education, and I was happy to hear that the Minister of Education took the time to meet with them. Parents in my own community never pass up the opportunity to speak to me about Ontario's publicly funded education system, as they see it as an essential vehicle for their child's ability to grow, develop and succeed, and I agree. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can you speak to some of the work underway in our government to boost student achievement rates and help children achieve excellence. Thank you, Minister of Education. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the uh, member from Barry for uh, her commitment to student excellence and for being such a fierce advocate on behalf of her community. Mr. Speaker, I know that uh, even before uh, becoming Ontario's Minister of Education, parents I'd meet in my community were so committed to their child's growth and development. They'd speak to me about what I call the continuum of learning. Our government has taken major steps to improve student outcomes. I'd, I'd like to highlight that despite declining enrollment in the province, our government has increased funding to our school boards by 59 per cent since wow. 2003. And with more students graduating today than at any other time in Ontario's history, this is proof Answer. that our government's plan to help students achieve excellence is working. And Mr. Speaker, the PC party wants to fight the fire and freeze out our teachers. Um, I'm going to remind the minister. I stand. You sit. Second uh, supplementary.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for your update. Certainly, it is clear that Ontario's record investments in education are making a difference in student achievement. Right. I know a lot of young parents who are putting their children into our publicly funded systems, and they're interested in the quality of the buildings in which their children are learning. We all know that you have made major investments across the province to build new schools and repair older ones. Sure. We also know that the PC party has a terrible track record when it comes to education. When they were in government, they closed schools, increased class sizes, and in the last election, the, the current leader of the opposition, MPP Brown, my MP at the time, Stop the clock. I'm listening carefully for a government question, and it should be there. Get to that point. Uh, he patted Tim Hudak on the back as he announced that they would fire 100,000. Start the clock. <clears throat> if the member does not follow my instructions, I'll pass. Carry on. Can the minister inform this House about our government's long track record of increasing investments in rural school boards, including the building of new schools? Thank you. Minister. Sure, and I want to thank uh, the wonderful member from Barrie again for the question. Mr. Speaker, we've worked so hard to make Ontario's education system one of the best in the world. But your, the question asked was specifically about rural school boards. Let's look at Lambton Kent Middlesex. Funding for Lambton Kent Middlesex schools was increased by approximately 500. 52.9 million dollars an increase of 65% since 2003 per pupil funding has also increased by $4,500 since 03 an increase of 62% our government has also built six new schools in this rural community our lady of lords catholic school st nicholas catholic school st st andre Bassett catholic school wilberforce public school mary wright public school and west nisor public school even though the member from that area enthusiastically ran on a plan to fire teachers in his own community. We will continue to build Ontario's education system. Say it, please. I'm going to I'm going to indicate to the government I'm a little bit disappointed and I am concerned that you are ascribing motive to any member other than your own writing, and it needs to stop. The decorum does not get helped. New question. The member from Nipissing. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. Yesterday, we learned from a Crown lawyer that the Energy Minister sought an alleged bribe to run in a by-election. In the court of public opinion, it's clear this government and minister only do what's best for the Liberal Party. The people of Ontario deserve better. They deserve a government that puts the interests of the people first. They deserve an energy minister who, clearly, who is clearly focused on the hydro crisis that's impacting families and businesses across the province. Mr. Speaker, will the energy minister do the right thing and resign. Attorney General. The Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, the uh, Minister of Energy is absolutely doing the right thing. He is working as very as hard as he possibly can to make sure that we have clean, reliable energy in this province, Speaker. Now, we do, as I as I was saying earlier, I still haven't had any explanation for these secret negotiations between a candidate in Scarborough Rouge River and the office of the Leader of the Opposition. You see, this secret uh, negotiation was appears to be about whether or not a candidate might withdraw from the election because she was uh, getting support from people who the Conservatives wanted to get speaker. This all has to do with the flip-flop, 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 flip on sex education. Answer. It's, uh, there are lots of questions around the negotiations, these secret negotiations between the candidate and the leader. Thank you. Supplementary. I want to go back to the Attorney General. In the North, 
in the North, seat. Speaker, we work hard seat. and play by the rules. That's the example we expect in our elected officials. However, it's clear the energy minister forgot his northern roots. From backroom deals to a record five OPP investigations, this Liberal government has repeatedly shown that it's ethically challenged. Now the Minister of Energy is distracted by legal problems as opposed to working to address the hydro crisis his government created. He's failing Ontario families and businesses, and he's failing the people of Sudbury and the people of the North. Mr. Speaker, Question. will the Energy Minister do the right thing on behalf of his constituents and resign? Order, please. Thank you. Deputy Premier. My constituents are looking forward to January 1st when they're going to see an 8% reduction in the hydro bill, thanks to the Minister of Energy. And in the North, Speaker, in the most uh, remote parts of this province, they'll see a 20% decrease, Speaker. That's the kind of hard work the people in the North are grateful for, and that's been led by our Minister of Energy, Speaker. Now, I do want to go back to this kind of puzzling coincidence. Um, as you know, a, a new leader was elected by, uh, by the PC party speaker. Uh, he needed a seat, and uh, he looked around, and he found one speaker. Uh, he found one that was already held by the Conservative Party. Uh, that was held by Garfield Dunlop, Speaker. Now, in a strange, strange coincidence, the very day that Garfield Dunlop resigned Answer. his seat to make way for the now leader of the opposition, Speaker, he got a job. He Thank got you. a job with the party. New question. The member from Windsor to come see. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the acting premier. Good morning. For years, we in the NDP have been calling on the Liberal government to develop an automotive strategy for Ontario. We've lost far too many manufacturing jobs in this province. Unifor has settled a new contract with the American-based auto industry. Ottawa isn't doing anything to protect auto jobs. President-elect Trump is threatening to tear up existing trade contracts. Speaker, what is the Wynn government doing to protect and grow Ontario's automotive industry? We need an automotive strategy, and we need it now. Thank you. Deputy Premier, well, Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Well, Mr. Speaker, we do have an automotive strategy in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and it's working pretty darn well. We've seen in the last three weeks alone $1.5 to $1.7 billion of commitment and investments in places all over the province, including Windsor, Oshawa, St. Catharines, Woodstock, St. And among others. I'm trying to think of some of the others, Mr. Speaker. Brampton. Mr. Speaker, we're seeing a real renaissance of investment in the province of Ontario, and it's, be it's coming because we do have a very effective automotive strategy, not only, Mr. Speaker, in supporting the jobs in today's auto automotive sector, the assembly jobs, but also promoting our ability to innovate in that sector and be leaders in that sector. We have a long and healthy past in the auto sector, and we have a long and prosperous future, Mr. Speaker, Answer. primarily because we do have a very effective automotive strategy. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Essex. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the Premier's appointed so-called auto czar has been absolutely silent, and there is no automotive strategy in the province of Ontario. Let's be frank, Speaker. It's been left up to the workers in those plants to fend for themselves against market conditions, to make themselves productive, despite uh, no action on, on the part of this government. Speaker, crossing your fingers and hoping for the best is not an automotive strategy. We need a plan. We deserve a plan that addresses the skyrocketing prices of hydro, makes us the most productive uh, place to manufacture automotive parts, aerospace parts. We can do that, but we need leadership from the provincial government. When is this government going to get to the table Order. and devise an automotive policy that protects workers in the province of Ontario? Thank you. Minister. You see it, please? You see it, please? Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, when it comes to auto and manufacturing, this province has put forward $1.7 billion of investment. That's leveraged $16 billion from private sector manufacturers in this province. 70,000 manufacturing jobs have been created by that policy, Mr. Speaker. So how can you stand there and say that we have no policy? Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is the plants in Windsor, those engine plants, were considered to be dead and gone because this government has an effective policy, because we work closely with Uniform, because we work in partnership with the— Carry on. I'll comment on a heckle I just heard. Sure. Would you like to go? Minister. Mr. Speaker, the NDP should be should be complimenting this government. Answer on the great work we've done in partnership with Unifor, in partnership with our auto pa 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 partners, to save and ensure that Thank we you. have a great future for tens of thousands of auto workers. Thank you. New question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, I'm happy to rise today on National Housing Day, and my question is for the Minister of Housing and Poverty Reduction. As I said, it gives me great pleasure to address the Legislature and mark National Housing Day. National Housing Day is an opportunity for us to recognize the importance of people having a place to call home. Clean, safe and affordable housing can improve a person's health and the prospects for a good education and employment. Mr. Speaker, this need for affordable housing is something that I often hear from my constituents in my riding of Davenport. But at the same time, Mr. Speaker, it is time to reflect on the work to be done. Mr. Speaker, would the minister please inform the House today on National Housing Day T tell the House how the government is helping to promote affordable housing across the province of Ontario. Thank you, Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Davenport for that uh, that good question. You know, Speaker, we've made some real progress uh, in working to improve the lives of vulnerable people across this great province. Since 2003, for example, Ontario has committed more than five billion dollars, five billion dollars to affordable housing. We're also supporting the creation of over 20,000 affordable rental housing units and making more than 275,000 repairs and improvements to social and affordable housing units. Our government, Mr. Speaker, is also helping to reduce homelessness through the Community Homelessness Prevention Initiative. As we work towards our goal to end chronic homelessness by 2025, Speaker, I'm proud that we're increasing investments in Chippy across the province by $45 million over the next three Answer. years. Our investments are working to strengthen Ontario, Speaker, by promoting a housing market that serves the full range of housing needs, Thank protects you. tenants, and encourages private sector. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, and I want to uh, congratulate you for all the great th work that you're doing on this particular file. I know that my constituents in Davenport will be very pleased to know and to hear about all of the investments that you refer to and uh, all the commitments that our province is making in terms of addressing the affordable housing issue we have here in the province. Today, the federal government is releasing a summary of community and stakeholder consultations on housing issues as part of the national housing strategy. Mr. Speaker, it has been over three decades since the last major national, ho national housing strategy discussion took place. I'm glad to see the new federal government is working with both the provinces and territories to change this. Question. I know Ontario welcomes our new federal partner and the opportunity to engage in this strategy as we have long called for. Can the minister share with this House Thank how you. this vision will be made a reality with the proper funding? Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, and I, again, I'd like to thank the member for that uh, for that question. You know, Speaker, I believe that all levels of government have a shared responsibility for housing across uh, this country. We agree that all Canadians deserve housing that is suitable and affordable. It's why when I went to the, the first National Housing Strategy Roundtable in Victoria in June, I was delighted to see a federal government minister responsible for housing there. It was the first time in eight years, eight years, eight years that there had been a federal minister there. Uh, Mr. Speaker, because, because Speaker, the, 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 while Ontario, and while Ontario welcomes the strength and partnership, uh, strength and partnership, Mr. Speaker, with the federal government uh, and the recent investments from the last federal budget, what our communities really need is long-term, a long-term funding partner Answer. at the table. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Ontario needs a national housing strategy that includes stable supply of flexible funding that can only be achieved. Uh, when we have a vision through Thank a successful you. national housing strategy. I beg to inform the House that, um, that I have today laid upon the table the 2016 Annual Greenhouse Gas Progress Report from the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.